Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Thomas Burr. I'm the Washington correspondent for the Salt Lake Tribune and the 109th president of the National Press Club. Our guest today is Jonathan Jarvis, the director of the National Park Service. I'd like to welcome our public radio and C-SPAN audiences, and I would like to remind you that you can follow the uh, action on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLive. That's NPCLive. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask that each of you stand briefly as your name is announced. Please hold your applause until I have finished introducing the entire table. From your right, Dylan Brown, a reporter for E&E &E Publishing. Gene Tai, director of BBN, BBN Technologies and a longtime National Parks volunteer. Maria Recio, a correspondent from McClatchy Newspapers. Will Shafroth, president and CEO of the National Park Foundation. Elizabeth Boo Miller, Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times. The Honorable John Warner, former Secretary of the Navy and United States Senator from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Senator. Ferdos Al Farouk, medical device reporter for MedTech Insight and a press club board member. Skipping over our speaker for just a minute. Rod Kukro, reporter at E&E Publishing and the Press Club Speakers Committee uh, member who organized today's event. Thank you, Rod. Tom Crossan, the Chief of Public Affairs for the National Park Service. Del Wilbur, a reporter at the Los Angeles Times. April Slayton, Assistant Director for Communications at the National Park Service. And Andy Fisher, Senior Director of Communications for the Pew Charitable Trusts. Thank you all. Forty years ago, our speaker put on the uniform of a National Park Service seasonal interpretive arranger and went to work on the National Mall. In that year, our nation's bicentennial, the National Park Service was a mere 60 years old. Later this month, the Park Service turns 100, and Jonathan Jarvis is still wearing the green and gray uniform. Uh, he has the hat here he'll put on in a minute, I think. Uh, no longer a temporary summertime employee, Jarvis is the leader of 22,000 employees who interpret, protect, and maintain the system of more than 400 national park units across all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and most U.S. territories. As the National Park Service enters its second century, it faces multiple challenges. Balancing the park's financial needs, even as Congress cuts the $3 billion budget while demanding the agency do more. A $12 billion maintenance backlog cultivating a new generation of younger and more diverse park visitors and volunteers, adapting to the effects of climate change in parks, including the loss of glaciers, coastlines, and wildlife habitats, addressing well-publicized occurrences of sexual harassment at the Grand Canyon and other parks, dealing with the effects of energy, mining, and other developments in the proximity to the parks. In his career, Jarvis has worn a, just about every hat you can wear at the Park Service, even though every hat of the Park Service looks like. He's been a scientist, ranger, superintendent, regional director, and now director. I'd also personally like to thank Director Jarvis, who agreed last fall to come to my January inauguration and swear me in as the new press club president. Of course, that was before we knew about the pending Snowzilla storm and the couple feet of snow that crippled Washington. Still, Director Jarvis showed his grit in coming to the hastily moved up inaugural. Thankfully, today we have slightly better weather. Uh, this is the first time in the history of the National Press Club the Park Service Director has addressed the club. Please welcome to the Press Club podium, Jonathan Jarvis, as he tells us of his plans for the centennial year of the National Park Service. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, it's great to be back um, in a little warmer weather than the last time we were here. And thank you, Rod, for uh, organizing this as well. And Senator, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, as was mentioned, this year the National Park Service will be 100 years old, and I will have served for 40 of those years, so I have a few opinions about <laughs> the second century. Uh, let me start with an excerpt from the Atlantic magazine. The president wanted all the freedom and solitude possible while in the park, so all newspaper men and other strangers were excluded. Even the Secret Service men and his physician and private secretaries were left at Gardner. He craved once more to be alone with nature. He was evidently hungry for the wild and the aboriginal, a hunger that seems to come upon him and drives him on his trips to the West. 
In the morning, he had stated his wish to go alone into the wilderness. His security detail very naturally did not quite like that idea. No, said the president, put me up a lunch and let me go alone. I will surely come back. And back he came. It was about five o'clock when he came briskly down the path from the east to the camp. It came out that he had tramped about 18 miles through very rough country. He came back looking as fresh as when he started and at night sitting before the big campfire related his adventures. This is John Burroughs' account of traveling with President Teddy Roosevelt in Yellowstone National Park in the spring of 1903. In 2013, almost 110 years later, I was hiking out of the same Yellowstone wilderness with my son, Ben. We were descending an open forest on a rock-strewn slope when the ground began to shake. And over the hill right behind us charged a stampeding herd of bison. We jumped behind a large boulder and the giant furry creatures thundered past so close I could have run my fingers through their manes. As the director of the National Park Service, I have the privilege to not only have some pretty wild experiences, but to sort of put them in context. And I think for a moment, if all of you think for the moment that this nation decided 100 years ago that such extraordinary places like Yellowstone could be set aside for the enjoyment of future generations, that, that concept that you and I <clears throat> can have a similar experience that Teddy Roosevelt had over 100 years ago. In 1914, Stephen Mather, who was an independently wealthy borax mining company uh, director, observed the deteriorating condition of the national parks, and he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Interior, Franklin Lane, um, complaining about that. And Secretary R Lane responded, Dear Steve, if you don't like the way the parks are being run, come down to Washington and run them yourself. Now, I would imagine such challenges have launched many political careers here in Washington. Um, so, in order to support the establishment of the National Park Service, Mather knew that if he got the right people into these extraordinary landscapes, they would become converts. So, on July 14, 1915, Mather gathered what became known as the Mather Mountain Party, and he led them for a two-week trip into the High Sierra. The party included writers for the Saturday Evening Post, the vice president of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the ranking Republican congressman on appropriations, president of the New York Zoological Society, and the publisher of the Visalia newspaper. It had photographers, attorneys, and businessmen, California state engineer, and Gilbert Grovner, the director of the National Geographic Society. There was one park ranger and two Chinese cooks, Tai Singh, uh, the Chinese cook was considered the best camp cook in the West. And he proved that every day with dinners for these folks of soup, salad, fried chicken, venison and gravy, potatoes, apple pie, and hot sourdough biscuits warmed on the, on the side of a sweaty mule that was laboring up <laughs> the area we know today as Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. For two weeks, this group uh, tramped and camped in alpine meadows, plunged into cold streams, and reveled under a starlit sky. Cunningly, Mather let the mountains do their magic, and the trappings of that busy society, even 100 years ago, sort of swept away. And bonds were formed not only with each other, but with the land. And each night around the fire, they talked about conservation and the future of the national parks. In that final bonfire night, as told by one of the travelers. Uh, Mather said, well, we've had many glorious days together, and I should confess why I wanted you to come. Not only for your interesting company, but to hope that you'd see the significance of these mountains in the whole picture of what we're trying to do. Hopefully you will take this message and spread it through the land in your own avenue and style. These valleys and heights of the Sierra Nevada are just one small part of the majesty of America. Although Sequoia and Yellowstone and Glacier and Crater Lake are already set aside, just think of the vast areas that should be preserved for the future. Think of the Grand Canyon, not yet protected, or the wonders of our territories in Alaska and Hawaii. He said, unless we can protect the areas currently held with a separate government agency, we may lose them to selfish interests. 
And that evening, every member of the party vowed to go back and provide their active support to the establishment of the National Park Service. Gil Grosvenor vowed that the National Geographic Society would march in step. And he fulfilled that promise by publishing in April of 1916 an entire issue, The Land of the Best, as a tribute to America. The press coverage in that period was quite extraordinary, and it influenced Congress when it came to a vote of the establishment of the National Park Service on August 25th, 2016, 100 years ago. This year, the National Geographic Society uh, devoted every issue in 2016 to some aspect of the parks, and on the 100th anniversary, released their uh, full issue, Yellowstone Battle for the West. And by the way, the media coverage for the NPS Centennial has been really unprecedented. I believe we are now over 8 billion media impressions uh, for the centennial. So thank you all for all the coverage we've gotten. We cannot take the future conservation for granted. We must use the magic of our parks and public lands to inspire and empower a new generation of conservation and historic preservation. In many ways, this centennial year has been a national Mather Mountain Party by inviting every American to find their park, that place that personally inspires them, rejuvenates them, and builds some patriotic pride. And without the least bit of sort of modesty, our centennial goal has been to create the next generation of visitors, supporters, and advocates for our national parks and our public lands. If we don't, then in the words of my predecessor, Director Mather, we may lose them to selfish interests who call for our parks and public lands to be developed for short-term private gain. So I want each of you for the moment to take a little bit of patriotic pride that our nation created this idea of national parks, and today that system embodies our highest ideals, our most symbolic places, and stands, frankly, as the best national park system in the world. They also tell the American story through place, 412 worthwhile places, places of great inspiration like the Statue of Liberty or Mount Rushmore, places of great beauty like Yosemite or the Grand Tetons, places of awe like the Grand Canyon and the Everglades, places of social conscience like Selma to Montgomery or the home of Frederick Douglass, or places of great ecological restoration like returning water flows to the Everglades, one of the most ambitious ecological restorations in American history. They are places of great history like Fort McHenry National Historic Site where our star-spangled banner yet waved and inspired Francis Scott Key to pen the poem that will be played at every U.S. gold medal in the Olympics this year. They are also places of great public health. The father of landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted, after a visit to Yosemite in 1865 said, that if we pursue our business lives without the occasional contemplation of nature, parks and parks, that men and women, I would, and this is a quote, be prone to a class of disorders including softening of the brain, nervous excitability, monomania, moroseness, melancholy, and irascibility. With all the irascibility in Washington, I'm wondering if people here need a prescription for the parks. <laughs> These are also places of social action, like the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where in 1939, just as Hitler invaded Europe, the extraordinary singer Marian Anderson, denied an inside venue because of her race, sang My Country Tis of Thee to a crowd of thousands on the mall. And on those same steps, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered I Have a Dream speech in 1963, inspiring the civil rights movement to carry on to the promised land. You can go to that spot today and stand in that very footsteps of Dr. King. You know, there are sections and sentiments of Dr. King's speech that really speak to different people in different ways, and I particularly find a connection with his closing when he called for freedom to ring from every mountainside and repeated the line from my country, tis of thee, land where my Fathers died, land of pilgrim's pride. These lands, believe it or not, are national parks and are public lands, like Gettysburg, the Freedom Trail, the Smokies, or Yosemite. These are parks and public lands that the, the bells of freedom are calling us to come and experience the healing, educational, and transformative powers 
of nature and history. They are also ringing the bells of freedom and justice, respect, truth, and calling us to live up to the values of our nation. You know, the National Park Service is unlike any other federal agency. We, we serve not only as stewards of the nation's greatest landscapes, but also as keepers of its cultural memory. And that recognizing that the American narrative is not one narrative, but many, it means telling that story in its entirety. So when I became director in 2009, with the encouragement of many individuals in this administration, and from the outside as well, we recognize that there are gaps in the American narrative as told by the national parks. And we must recommend to the president new designations to fill those gaps, to realize the inclusiveness and equality that have been part of the American vision, if not always the reality, we needed to start from the beginning. One summer day in 1619, a ship appeared off what was known as Port Comfort an English fort overlooking the Chesapeake Bay. That ship later became to known as the African Mayflower because it carried the first enslaved Africans to the colonies. By the time of the Civil War, Point Comfort had become the Union stronghold known as Fort Monroe, the only Union fort to stand through the Civil War south of the Mason-Dixon line. In the middle of the night, three escaped slaves appeared at Fort Monroe looking for sanctuary. General Benjamin Butler was at the command, and when the southern slave owners demanded the return of their property, Butler refused, acting only on his own. Butler's reasoning was that the slaves were Confederate contraband and could be confiscated by Union troops. This became known as the contraband decision, and President Abraham Lincoln traveled down to Fort Monroe, spent the evening with Butler, probably over a brandy or two, and traded their legal views. Lincoln returned to D.C. inspired with his own legal theory and penned the first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. The three Fort Monroe fugitives were the first slaves freed in the Civil War, and many more would follow. And so Fort Monroe bookends the beginning and the end of slavery in the United States. And on November 1, 2011, acting under the authority of the Antiquities Act, President Obama designated Fort Monroe and made a part of the national park system. During its struggle for independence in, colonial, in a colonial courthouse in Newcastle, Delaware, this nation set itself on a course unprecedented in the world. It was here that Delaware ratified the Constitution, the first state to do so, and asserted that under the laws of this new nation, we were creating all people had inalienable rights. And in March of 2013, President Obama designated First State National Monument as part of the national park system. Nearly 100 years after Delaware ratified the Constitution, we were still a long way from liberty and justice envisioned by the Founding Fathers. No one knew this better than Harriet Tubman, who for 12 years and a great personal risk repeatedly led slave, fugitive slaves into secret places of the Tidewater region and on to safety via the Underground Railroad. And in March of 2013, President Obama designated Harriet Tubman National Monument. A generation later, Charles Young was a rarity at West Point in the 1880s. He was the only the third African American to attend the, the academy. He rose to colonel, but was denied the rank of general due to discrimination in the military. Nonetheless, his distinguished career took him from that famous cavalry unit known as the Buffalo Soldiers to the Philippine insurrection to the pursuit of Pancho Villa and ultimately to burial at Arlington Cemetery. At one point, Colonel Young served as the superintendent of Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park when the U.S. Army Buffalo Soldiers looked over our national parks. And on March 25, 2013, President Obama designated the Colonel Charles Young National Monument as part of the national park system. George Pullman of Chicago decided in 1862 on a new business model to build and lease fancy train cars that could be coupled to the fleet of trains across the country as we entered the 20th century. Pullman staffed those cars with African Americans, especially the descendants of slaves because he felt they would be the most subservient. He trained them, paid them a living wage, provided uniforms and a code of conduct. While still subject to racism, these men developed pride in their work as porters, emphasized education in their children, 
and seeded the growth of the black middle class. They were also organized by a young A. Philip Randolph and were part of a major railroad worker strike that resulted in the creation of what we know today as Labor Day. A. Philip Randolph's organizational skills would be applied to the civil rights movement that swept the nation in the 50s and 60s, including the bravery of those at Little Rock Nine. And on February 19, 2015, President Obama designated Pullman National Monument. Now, all of us know that the struggle for civil rights has not just been limited to African Americans, but to others who have been discriminated against because of the color of their skin, their religion, or their sexual orientation. 75 years ago, next year, at the outset of World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, ordering all residents of the Western United States who were of Japanese ethnicity to be rounded up by the military and imprisoned in confinement camps hastily constructed. Given only a few days, over 120,000 people, most of whom were American citizens, were forced into trains, buses, and leaving behind homes, businesses, and most of their worldly possessions. They were transported to remote locations like the Owens Valley of California, the Snake River Plain of Idaho, and a bug-infested gulch in Hawaii, where they were imprisoned for three years. And on February 24, 2015, recognizing the tragedy of racial profiling and injustice during wartime and its relevance to today, President Obama designated Hana'uli National Monument as a part of the national park system. <clears throat> From the social upheaval of the 1960s, along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., another figure rose above others to carry the banner of civil rights. That was Cesar Chavez. Chavez fought for the exploited Latino and Filipino workers in Central California who had endured persistent racism and unsafe working conditions. On October 8, 2012, to immortalize this great man's sacrifice for farm workers, President Obama designated Cesar Chavez National Monument. Here in Washington, in a rambling historic home, a group of women led by Alice Paul and Alva Belmont determined that the liberty and opportunity granted to citizens of this nation should be applied to the other 50% of the population who were female. There, the National Women's Party for hundreds, uh, drafted and helped pass hundreds of pieces of legislation that changed the status of women in America. And in April of 2016, President Obama designated the Belmont Paul's Women's Equality National Monument here in DC. And on June 28, 1969, at Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village in New York City, events shaped the modern LGBTQ civil rights movement. It was at this site that New York City police conducted a raid that had become routine at gay bars and often resulted in harassment and arrests. Unlike previous raids, the crowds held their ground in demanding civil rights and refused to disperse. The protest expanded to neighboring streets and into nearby Christopher Park and grew as many as several thousand people, lasted for six days and marked a significant turning point in the struggle for LGBTQ rights. Within a few years, LGBTQ people across the country had formed gay rights groups in almost every major city. And on June 24th, 2016, President Obama designated Stonewall Inn National Monument as part of the national park system. These nine new national monuments in the national park system represent people who believed in the aspirations of our country and the places where they acted upon their faith, their spirit, and their convictions. Their stories are now part of the national park system where they will inspire future generations, carry on the message that the blessings of liberty must be defended from all threats, whether they are external or from within. Our centennial mission in the National Park Service amounts to a promise to America that we will keep not only its sacred places, but the memory of its most defining moments. A few moments ago, or a few minute, months ago, I shared the dais with the poet laureate of the National Park Service Centennial, Dr. Sonia Sanchez. She reminded us all about truth. It's a quote. I cannot tell the truth about anything unless I confess being a student, growing and learning something new every day. The more I learn, the clearer my view of the world becomes. So I invite all of you here with the press and all of you out there uh, in our country to come to the national parks 
and gain a clearer view of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jarvis. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get through. So, uh, uh, not surprising. Thank you for not making us a national park, by the way. We were a little <laughs> worried coming in today. That's in the future. There you go. Uh, so uh, you talked about new designations. You talked about uh, a little bit of the challenges of maintenance backlog. Uh, so the first question I have to ask you is, is with all the added new designations, the new area, the, 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 the acres, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres added to your portfolio, uh, does that benefit the Park Service or does it become more of a challenge because you already have a $12 billion backlog? So the approach that we've taken in adding new units to the National Park Service, and let me just clarify, we're up uh, 22 new units to the National Park System since I came on as the director in this administration. That is both through Congress and through Presidential Act under the Antiquities Act. In most cases, we have, um, in almost every case, we have minimized uh, our footprint, uh, the actual amount of land uh, or resource that we need to uh, take care of. And we have brought in, through particularly the work of the National Park Foundation, philanthropic partners to assist with that and have been actually, frankly, quite successful at raising uh, funds. So on one hand, it does add to our overall responsibility, uh, but I think we've been very judicious in uh, ensuring that it does not add significantly to our maintenance backlog. So how are you going to tackle that backlog? Because we've seen, we're celebrating the 100-year anniversary. Uh, we have crumbling roads and bridges, deteriorating trails, outdated electrical and sewer systems. How are you going to tackle that $12 billion backlog? So um, let me characterize uh, the, the maintenance backlog. We, we understand our maintenance backlog at sort of an excruciating level of detail. We really, really know this down to the, down to the brick. Um, so about half of our backlog is in the, what I would call the transportation side. So that is the roads and bridges piece. That is not an easy thing to raise philanthropic money for. That's something that is the responsibility uh, of appropriators. And we do get a significant amount of funding out of the transportation bill. Uh, and there is now a five-year bill to address high priority roads and bridges in the national park system. The other half, uh, which what I call non-transportation assets, about half of that are what I call high priority assets. These are those that are directly related to visitor experience or of high significance value. The Lincoln Memorial, for instance, is a nice little asset that you might consider a high priority asset of the Park Service. In some cases, those we can raise philanthropic dollars for, and certainly all of you know that we've had significant contributions from individuals like David Rubenstein. Uh, to repair those as well. And we have a campaign uh, with the National Park Foundation to address many of those issues. But we are also going to need a steady uh, supply of federal appropriations, and we have asked uh, the Congress to respond to that. We have centennial legislation before them uh, that would give us greater flexibility with our existing revenues, uh, such as fees, uh, and generate some new revenues uh, that we could address the maintenance backlog. So let's talk about the uh, the public partner, uh, public uh, uh, pr private partnerships in some form. Uh, how do we ensure that we don't end up with the the Exxon tram and the Disney whatever uh, trail of some sort? And and with these partnerships, how do you avoid the situation where Congress may say, well, you've got this this private money from corporations, we don't need to give you as much? Um, so I'll, I'll address the first one. First of all, um, as a as a young woman here spoke to me earlier and talked about the railroad industry, we have always had relationships with corporate America uh, from the very beginning of the national parks. Uh, it was the railroads that built most of the major lodges, the old historic lodges like the El Tavar and others that you're familiar with. And throughout my 40 years, we've had long-term relationships with corporate America without selling out, uh, without renaming or this park brought to you by um, uh, we just don't do that. Um, we sit down with corporate America and say, what are your goals? These are our goals. This is an area you, you can't go, uh, and we're not going to allow that. So I think you should trust us that we are protecting these assets uh, from, um, you know, branding and labeling. Um, it is not the direction we're headed. What we're trying to do is sort of modernize uh, our philanthropic capability 
both for the service, the National Park Foundation, and all of the friends groups that raise money for us. And the second part of that was, what if Congress looks at that and says, hey, look, you're getting a lot of money from corporate America. We don't need to give you as much. So um, we've always defined uh, a line in the sand, a bright line between what philanthropic support is, whether it's corporate or individual or foundation, and what is the responsibility of the federal taxpayer of the U.S. appropriations process. And we feel that the basic operation of a national park is a responsibility of appropriators. And that there's, there's uh, and then philanthropy, uh, it gives us that sort of margin of excellence on top of that. And they are not replaceable uh, one over the other. What about user fees? Do you see a, a reason to raise entrance fees or fees for things like campgrounds or lodges, tour operators uh, to, to help winnow down that, that backlog? So um, we have a fee program. Uh, we raise about um, 200, 200, 220 million a year in our fee program. Uh, we are, uh, have the authority to retain all of that money in the National Park Service. Uh, a, a fee collecting park retains 80% 20% is pooled for the non-fee parks. Um, and um, we would never be able to run the national parks on our fee program, first of all. Uh, we never want our fees to be so high that they exclude some component of the American public, that parks are for everyone, uh, not just for uh, the rich or the elite. That was the whole point of the way we created the national parks in this country. They were in Europe where we, uh, some of our, our ancestors came from that were those places, the special places were just for the rich and not here in the U.S. So we will always keep our fees low enough that they can be affordable. So you're not going to say whether we'll see an increase in the next couple of years? Um, well, we already have. Let me, let me just back up for a second. So in 2009, I put a moratorium on fee increases uh, and I retained that uh, moratorium until 2015. So we froze uh, fees at their current level. And in 2015, I allowed the national parks across the system to consider and to go into public uh, comment period for fee increases. And we did allow some to increase, but we'll probably hold it there for a while. Um, there is a, as you, as you do implement a fee program, uh, you get pushback from the public. Um, it's still a great deal, but uh, I, I, I am not planning on raising them again anytime soon. I don't have the question in front of me, but uh, a senior, <laughs> some applause for that. Uh, by the way, I, also, I always note at these moments that uh, the general public is allowed at our, our luncheons here at the press club, so if you hear applause, it's not necessarily from the journalists covering the event. <laughs> um, I did have a question I don't have in front of me from a senior who was a little concerned that you might raise the uh, golden uh, pass. I believe it's, is it still $10? Is that going to raise? Yeah, so um, this shows my age. I have one of these. Uh, this is the senior pass. Uh, it is $10 for life. Uh, um, I would say it's a little undervalued. Um, um, and, but this price uh, was set by Congress. Uh, I don't have the authority to change it. We do have a proposal uh, before Congress to increase uh, this pass. Uh, it'd still be a lifetime, uh, but to make it equal to the America the Beautiful pass, which is $80. So you pay $80 once for life. Uh, that, Delta between $10 and $80 would generate about $35 million uh, for us because we sell a lot of these, um, and that would all be used for the maintenance backlog. So this is a good question uh, from the audience. Uh, for most of the Park Service 100 years, support uh, for Congress and preserving wilderness, national landmarks, battlefields, and other unique natural wonders was strong and bipartisan. Uh, in recent years, that support seems to have unraveled. How's the Park Service uh, going to repair that political rift? And why is there a political rift? Well, um, I'll probably get in trouble for telling this story, but um, the, um, uh, you know, when I go on the Hill uh, regularly uh, to, uh, to meet with members of Congress, um, there has been historically uh, bipartisan uh, support for the national parks. Uh, long tradition of great support both sides of the aisle. Sometimes different priorities, but um, and, um, you know, when I go and testify before uh, a committee, uh, there's a lot of sort of finger pointing and accusations made about the national parks. But when I go into the office uh, for certain individuals, they pull down the shades and they get out their park pass and want me to sign it. Um, 
and they tell me their latest National Park trip story. So part of the issue, uh, I mean, in my estimation, is that there is a, a, a um, uh, sort of a political agenda around that there, nothing in government is good. And it's hard to admit that if you say that, that there is this aspect of government that they actually like, which is the national parks. And so uh, what we've been trying to do uh, through the centennial uh, is reintroduce ourselves uh, to the American people, the ones that don't necessarily know who we are. Uh, they don't know the depth and breadth of the work that we complete uh, and have that translate into support across the aisle, something that we enjoyed uh, for much of our first 100 years and certainly would hope to enjoy in our second 100. I'm not going to ask you to name those members of the Congress. <laughs> that would be able to. Uh, so we talked about this a little before. I was noting that I plan to go to Arches National Park later this month. Um, what are you doing uh, as part of this celebration to wor control the overcrowding that we're seeing in some of the national parks like at Arches? So we are experiencing uh, record levels of visitation uh, as a result of the Centennial, the Find Your Park campaign, uh, our outreach, the media coverage, all of that. So this past year, uh, 2015, which is the last year we kept record, uh, we surpassed 312 million visitors. And uh, let me put that in perspective. That is more than all of Disney, more than all of national football, national baseball, national basketball, soccer, NASCAR combined. Um, so, um, and we do it on the budget of the city of Austin, Texas, which you did fact check, and that is correct. Um, the, um, uh, so, um, the way I view this is that when the public come to uh, national parks, um, uh, something happens. Uh, yes, it can be somewhat overwhelming for our employees, and uh, that's sort of the state of the art right now, um, but you're you are deepening that connection, uh, and that connection translates into support uh, as a volunteer, as an advocate, uh, through our variety of advocacy groups out there that they can translate, fringe groups at the local level, uh, support to Congress. Um, and so, um, I think there is a upside to the visitation side. Um, and it also is inviting a generation that perhaps didn't know uh, about these places. Our goal is not to just raise the numbers, but to increase the diversity uh, of that visitation as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, so when the centennial is over, what, what, what is in the works to try to keep this energy and excitement about the parks going past this centennial? Well, we've been having a lot of discussions about what do we do when we blow out the candles um, had this year uh, because there has been a huge uh, push. Uh, and I know many of my staff are like, you know, <laughs> we're through. Um, our goal really has been to, um, as I said, to connect with this next generation and, uh, and inspire them. And I think the next phase is empowering them uh, to to bring the concept of conservation, historic preservation back into their own communities, uh, within their social networks, uh, to give them uh, the tools and the power to execute on that uh, from what they have learned uh, about the national parks as well. So many of the initiatives that we've launched, uh, the theme studies around the contributions of Latinos and women and Asian American Pacific Islanders and LGBT will be carrying on into the next administration, and we'll be looking for new sites that recognize that uh, as well. So I don't see a, a lot of this stuff just ending. Speaking of uh, the Smithsonian, uh, the new Smithsonian for African Americans uh, history is, is opening up on the mall very soon. Uh, is there an effort now to try to educate visitors about such milestones, such uh, history at national parks, especially around the Washington or Northeast Corridor? Well, education has always been uh, a core of our mission. Um, and, you know, we like to say, you know, come to the national parks, have, some, have a good time and learn something at the same time. And as Denny would say, don't fall down either. Um, um, and the, yes, absolutely. And in, in partnership with the Department of Education, uh, programs that we've created like Teacher Ranger Teacher, where school teachers serve as rangers in the summer and go back to the classroom. Uh, we have over 600 curriculum that we've developed around whether it's plate tectonics or civil rights uh, 
or endangered species, you can learn something in the national parks. Uh, and in some ways, it may actually stick with you a little longer than, than you learned in the classroom. Uh, this question is particularly of interest to my home state of Utah, but what is the Park Service or yours personally uh, thoughts on the efforts to turn federal land over to some western states? Uh, some say this could open up federal land to mining and drilling. Some states say they could manage these federal lands better. Well, I think that we need to step back and sort of look historically uh, at uh, sort of the portfolio of how states were established and, and the goals of establishing the, really the four big land management agencies. There are, there are four land management agencies that manage on the behalf of the American people the public land estate. They are the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we each have uh, different mandates. And um, particularly the Forest Service and the BLM have a multiple use mandate, and they provide for energy development, uh, sand and gravel, uh, timber, as well as the U.S. Forest Service as well. So these lands are already working landscapes, uh, and they're already benefiting the entire American people, not just one specific state. Uh, and so I think we've got to think very, very hard about uh, uh, retaining the public land estate and the national parks as well for the benefit of all the people and not just those uh, within one state boundary. Do you have a specific reaction to some states who say they can manage the parks better than the federal government can? Well, um, I have a lot of friends in the National Association of State Park Directors uh, who are the state park directors, and many of them are struggling significantly financially, uh, that they have uh, lost a lot of uh, state legislative appropriations as well. And so I would say that the, the public land estate is, is being well managed and would continue to be best managed under the federal government. Thank you, sir. Let's uh, switch gears here a little bit. Uh, there were a number of high-profile cases of wild animal attacks uh, of people this summer. Uh, the alligator killing a baby uh, at the Disney Beach in Florida, for example. What message do you have for people enjoying wildlife this summer, visiting national parks, and for companies, organizations, rangers overseeing recreational opportunities that involve wildlife? Well, you know, the thing about wildlife is that they're wild. Um, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I think there is this, on one hand, you know, we try in the National Park Service to let the public know uh, that that bison laying down over there is not tame, uh, it's not behind a fence, and it can outrun a horse, um, and you really shouldn't go over and pat it on the head. Um, and um, there are risks uh, in these wild places, and we want the public to be educated about those risks and learn how to um, experience them. Uh, which can be a fantastic, incredible experience to be in those environs. Uh, but there is a risk element, and um, we're working very hard to help educate the public about those. Uh, Florida officials said uh, recently they are investigating, I believe this morning said 10 cases of, of, of locally transmitted Zika virus. Uh, as the summer continues, do you see a threat of vi the virus spreading and to the point where you may have to close uh, some parks in the southern United States? Well, we certainly haven't got to the point of considering closure, but um, we definitely feel that uh, Zika can be, uh, is going to be a significant problem in the southern tier parks. I mean, the Everglades, uh, Biscayne, uh, Big Thicket, a number of these areas, Dry Tortugas, uh, these are all southern tier parks uh, that have large mosquito populations. Uh, this particular species, uh, Aedes aegypti, is, is not really a species that breeds in the waters of the Everglades. It's much more of a human contact uh, species. Um, and, uh, but we have been working with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention specifically on information for the public and information for our own employees that work in those environments as well. The questioner wants to know, there's only one Jamestown in America. Why isn't the administration pushing back harder on Dominion Power's proposal to build massive transmission lines within the historic view of Jamestown? I know whose question that was. <laughs> Um, well, I'll tell you one thing, I'm pushing back really hard on it, and there are a number of folks in this room that are pushing hard on that. You're absolutely right, there is only one Jamestown, uh, and it, it should not be marred with a, uh, a transmission line. Let's stick on that subject for a second. There is oil and gas exploration in close proximity of some <coughs> parks, uh, the Everglades, for example. Uh, do you believe 
seismic testing equipment and trucks used to perform exploratory cause no cause no harm to the Everglades ecosystem? Um, well, I don't think it causes no harm. Um, I think there can be harm from any of that type of activity. Uh, we are in litigation over that right now, so I really can't go into the details uh, of that specific case. Um, but um, it is something that uh, when we have a split estate um, and individuals have rights uh, to explore that state, it puts us uh, in a bind. On the same subject, what, what uh, threat does mining, or any threat, uh, if, if at all, to does mining pose to the park system? For example, uh, gold and uranium exploration near Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon. So, um, as you may know, Secretary Salazar withdrew about a million acres adjacent to um, the Grand Canyon uh, for uh, a 20-year withdrawal for uranium mining. Um, and I, without getting down in the weeds too deeply, uh, the concept of how you, you mine for uranium is you drill down, and as you do, you penetrate impermeable uh, geologic layers and allow water to fil infiltrate. If you stand at the Grand Canyon and you look across, you can see springs and seeps uh, that where water comes out. And the potential for uranium mining is that that uranium radioactive ore could come out of those springs and into the Colorado River and downstream into the potable water systems of millions of people uh, in the southern half of the Colorado River system. So it's a pretty significant concern for us. So mining on adjacent lands can have significant impacts to national parks, and we spend a lot of time working with those, uh, those individuals to, uh, to mitigate those. Uh, this happens in my home state and in the West. This is also happening in Maine right now. Often local residents uh, are, are hostile or against the idea of creating a new national park, for example, the North Woods Park uh, in Maine. Uh, what assurances would you give uh, local residents that this would actually be a benefit to them rather than a detriment? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, if you look historically at the establishment of many of these national parks, they were always a fight. There was a fight over the Grand Canyon. Uh, and um, ultimately, you know, the president had to use uh, the Antiquities Act to protect the Grand Canyon because there were many people opposed to its establishment uh, early on. I think if you look at history uh, and past practice, and I was just recently in Seward, uh, Alaska, and for those of you that were around during the Alaska Lands Act days, the city of Seward passed a resolution, uh, total opposition of the establishment of Kenai Fjords National Park, and here recently the, the, the city council rescinded that resolution uh, unanimously in support of Kenai Fjords National Park. So if you look at, you know, Estes Park and Moab and, and Seward and even Forks, Washington, uh, outside of Olympic, you'll see communities that have benefited economically, uh, quality of life, uh, the kids can find work, all of that, from the establishment of national parks in, uh, adjacent. Uh, this questioner wants to know, uh, the, the, the organization uh, he or she works for is ready to present the Park Service the petition with over 200,000 signatures uh, from citizens who feel that the revision of director's order number 21 will over-commercialize our parks. So maybe you could quickly explain what uh, director's order number 21 is and when will the Park Service make a final decision regarding the revision of this order? Okay, Director's Order 21 is the policy document that governs uh, the relationship with private philanthropy, uh, both corporate, individual, and uh, foundation philanthropy, and how that is recognized. Um, I have a, a citizen's advisory board, the National Park System Advisory Board, and I commissioned them to essentially give us a state-of-the-art report uh, on how philanthropy is done in this country today, how donor recognition is done. And they made a recommendation uh, to me uh, for a revision of DO 21, Director's Order 21, so that the Park Service could consider a range of options to increase the potential for philanthropy, but do it in a way that is respectful of the stewardship that we have for these places. And um, they have done so. We've taken public comment on that. Um, and we are in the process of finalizing that, and we will have DO 21 uh, completed and signed by me by the end of the year. Thank you, sir. Uh, some tougher questions. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle have criticized the Park Service for uh, 
complaints about sexual misconduct, harassment, and other unethical behavior. Uh, what actions specifically have you taken to address those concerns? Okay, I think most of you know that there was an Inspector General report specific to the Grand Canyon uh, River uh, District uh, where there was a horrible uh, sexual harassment uh, by our Park Service employees. We fully recognize and admit to that. Uh, and there have been other cases that have emerged here most recently in a few other parks around the system. So a couple things that we have done uh, right away to address this. In the canyon specifically, uh, we have a new superintendent on the ground, Chris Lennertz, uh, first woman uh, in the history of Grand Canyon is the new superintendent. And I traveled out there with the secretary last week and uh, introduced her to the staff. Uh, she was the former superintendent Golden Gate and she will do a fantastic job there, first and foremost, of addressing right in the canyon how they both root this out uh, and, uh, and restart uh, the relationship with the community and, and their employees. Service-wide, uh, we have engaged uh, a number of other organizations that have been dealing with this, specifically the Department of Defense, uh, who has had uh, both its own uh, troubled history around harassment and abuse. And so we've learned a lot from them. And first and foremost, we need to establish a baseline of understanding of how prevalent this is in the National Park Service. I honestly don't know, uh, and we're not gonna know until we do a well crafted uh, survey of all employees that's done uh, with protection of anonymity. Uh, once we establish that baseline, then we can understand uh, more specifically how to take action. We are jumping on top of any, obviously, reports right now, and I've set a standard with my senior leadership uh, of what I expect to, how to implement a zero tolerance policy in terms of quick action, protection of the victim, uh, and, uh, and zero tolerance uh, for this work, uh, for uh, this horrible uh, component. I will say that um, our employees uh, will be stepping up uh, once they see that we are taking action. I expect the numbers of reported incidents to increase. Not that there are more cases that I think employees are now uh, feeling more empowered to, step, to speak up and step up, and I expect that to occur uh, not only in the National Park Service, but within other agencies that are, that, are, that are seeing what's happened to the Park Service and are following our lead. Just to follow on that, uh, are there protections and have you communicated those protections for whistleblowers, for people who have been victims of this to make sure that they can uh, raise their concerns above the person who may be stationed with them they're worried about talking to? Yes, we're in the process of standing up an a, uh, anonymous hotline uh, that will allow individuals, if they are caught in a situation where the harasser may be their direct line supervisor or within the reporting chain, that they can go around that chain and, uh, and get uh, immediate response. Thank you, sir. Earlier this year, the Interior Department Inspector General faulted you personally for writing a book about the national parks to be sold in national park shops uh, without getting clearance from ethics officials because of a uh, concern that you may have given an appearance of a conflict of interest, uh, even though you were not apparently benefiting financially. Why did you not go through the ethics officials to write this book? Good question. Um, um, and I have um, uh, apologized uh, to uh, the Department of the Interior, to the Secretary, and to my employees for that, uh, that lapse in judgment. Um, and, uh, you know, 2020 hindsight uh, is often perfect. Um, I would do it, uh, I would ask next time. Can you talk about the uh, perceptible effects of climate change on any specific national parks or monuments or any of your units? And what can be done, if anything, to address those concerns? So I've said many times that climate change is probably the most uh, threatening aspect of the future to the national parks, and we are already seeing a direct effect uh, uh, to specific parks. And I can give you an example. Uh, I was the superintendent at Mount Rainier National Park and uh, that's the Cascades right outside of Seattle. And typically, historically, if you look at climate records for Mount Rainier, it gets a lot of snow, one of the snowiest places uh, in uh, the lower 48. Um, and usually you would get snow in the fall and rain in the spring. And that rain would just come down on the snow like a big sponge and soak it up and then let it out uh, through uh, the spring. It's shifted now to, um, Snow starts and then it converts to rain in the fall. And so you get rain on snow in the fall. You don't have enough snowpack uh, to absorb it and it creates a flood. 
And so we had about $35 million worth of damage in one event uh, in the fall of Mount Rainier, uh, just sweeping down uh, one of the river valleys and wiping out a campground that had been there for 100 years. Uh, glaciers disappearing in uh, Glacier National Park. Predictions are they'll all be gone within, uh, within a couple of decades. Fires burning longer, a month longer on either end of the season, uh, much hotter. Uh, we're seeing uh, post-fire situations with uh, vegetation not coming back in the same way as well. Migratory species arriving earlier or later, species moving up the mountain uh, to, uh, to stay cooler. So we're seeing effects all across the system. Thanks. So if you had a ma magic wand or a magic hat, whatever it may be, uh, there you go. He's, he has it here somewhere. <laughs> would you, would you, uh, what would you ask for? Rangers, scientists, <laughs> maintenance, money, what, what would you ask for? Um, I would ask for public support. Uh, I think uh, all of those things that you mentioned come from public support. And, uh, you know, I want the public to love their national parks. Uh, I want them to see their national parks and to be feel that their story is represented in the national parks. And if they feel that in a deep way, that will translate uh, into funding, advocacy support uh, for our uh, mission to be accomplished in our second century. Thank you, sir. Before I ask the final question, I have a few announcements. A uh, quick reminder, the National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists, and we fight for a free press worldwide. For more information about the club, please, please visit our website at www.press.org. That's press.org. I'd also like to remind you about some upcoming programs. On Thursday, the National Press Club will hold its annual awards dinner to honor journalism's best reporting. And on August 14, award-winning actor Michael York will address the club. Now I'd like to present our guests with the traditional National Press Club mug. Now I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you two options for your last question, so you can't walk away yet. Uh, only because the, the, one of the questions I know is a tough one. Uh, I'm going to ask you to, out of your 400 or so units, name your favorite <laughs> national park. Or uh, you've, you've been with the Park Service for 40 years, so I'd like to know, uh, if not name your, your favorite national park, what was your scariest moment at a national park? Okay. Yeah, I, I love all my children, so I can't, uh, I can't <laughs> name my favorite. Um, but I will tell you uh, a great scary moment. Uh, so um, I worked in Alaska, and uh, I was at Katmai uh, National Park. And uh, if you've seen those pictures with the bears and the waterfalls, uh, there's only two places in Alaska that you can really go to see that, and one of them is Brooks Falls in Katmai. It was late in September. Uh, I was uh, above the falls uh, in the river fly fishing, which I like to do. Uh, and uh, I had a fish on, and a, one of those gigantic um, coastal uh, brown bears uh, jumped out of the bushes onto my fish. Uh, and I snapped my line off. And that bear took a very strong interest in me. Um, and for about the next two hours, I was probably never more than about 15 feet from that bear who followed me uh, through the woods. I crossed the stream uh, three or four times. I wound up swimming uh, across the mouth of the lake, uh, and the bear swam right behind me the whole way. Uh, um, and, uh, and I finally got to my cabin, uh, which was hard-sided, fortunately, and uh, sort of crashed through the door, uh, and my brother was sitting inside, sitting in front of a fire, reading a book, of course. And, um, and uh, he said, he's, you know, completely soaking wet and out of breath, and he said, what happened to you? And I said, come here and look out there. And the bear was standing on the porch. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you, Director Jarvis, for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching. And thanks to the staff of the National Press Club and the National Press Club Journalism Institute. We are adjourned. <laughs>